I am so thrilled to be here to introduce Arnie, who really needs no introduction. Um, I've really appointed myself the head of the Arnie Maynard fan club um, because this is a designer whose work I absolutely adore. Arnie is one of the leading landscape architects and designers in the world. Um, and he's that way because everything he does is so appropriate to the property he is working on. Um, I, I know Arnie is a gardener. You can tell he's a gardener. Uh, but his designs and his uh, use of plants are to me absolutely poetic. He never ever misses a beat. He works all over the world. And my real hope and dream one day is that I could have a property and have Arnie come and do it with me or for me. Um, I now want you to see his magic and I introduce you to Arnie Maynard. Thank you so much, uh, Arnie, for the lovely introduction. Um, I, 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 I was thrilled to be asked um, by the ICAA to host this lecture with you. Um, and I was thinking of what I could talk about. And for me, the most important things when I'm creating gardens uh, are the plants and the plants that make the formation of the garden, the pattern making in the garden are incredibly important, plus all of the jewels that we put into the structure of the gardens. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how I use those plants, but um, what I do is not original. It's been done 101 million times before. Um, but also we use plants in our gardens that early man has used and selected out of the landscape for specific purposes for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's so built into our psyche that uh, I wanted to share with you the plants and the ingredients that for generations um, from, from the earliest time that man started collecting plants um, and how we use them in gardens. So I'd like to start with my first slide at home in England, we're very lucky that we have ancient woodlands. A lot of them are ancient medieval woodlands. And this picture is part of a wonderful ancient woodland uh, of oak trees. And this is near me in Wales. And what I particularly love about this is the character and the atmosphere that these majestic ancient oak trees create within our landscape. And they're really rooted into the landscape. Um, and they're, they're one of the ingredients. And, and as we look at the wild landscape, we realize that for centuries, man has collected plants from the wild and we've interpreted them and used them in our garden to create our structure of our gardens that uh, uh, we then have to put all of our softer plantings within. So I just want to run through a little bit about the very early landscapes and how that feeds into our garden designs today. So here, this very early, um, oak woodland um, image. And this is a wonderful illustration from The Gardener's Labyrinth from Thomas Hill's book, which was written in or published in 1526. So you can see as early on as 1526, as gardeners, we were already collecting trees from our native stock of trees in the countryside. And we were bringing them into our enclosures of gardens and we were starting to see how we could train them and what we could do with particular plants, whether they were to create arbors or whether they were fruit trees that we started selecting from the wild and selecting each time a better, slightly larger apple, tastier apple. And it's this husbandry and gardening that we've been doing for centuries. Um, but before that even, we've been, we, we revere trees and we revere landscapes and they've been used in a lot of our early um, pagan sites as well, which I'll come to in a minute. But, but here you can see this particular gardener, he's collecting trees from the wild and he's bringing them into gardens. And it's about the art of horticulture and training that enables us to have our beautiful gardens. So it's something that we're all very familiar with at Altabella. Um, I have lots of topiary. This is one of the younger, this is one of the photos from many years ago when we started planting the garden. And this is one of the first formative clippings of a beech tree uh, into one of our topiary shapes that we have within the garden. Now, 
this beech tree here as a topiary in the broader landscape um, in the wild is a wonderful, huge natural growing tree. But as gardeners, we select those trees and we bring them into our gardens and we start to create forms out of them, whether they're topiaries, whether they're hedges, whether they're uh, part of a parterre or a maze. Uh, but it's our gardening skill of of adapting these trees to do different things within our garden landscape. But for years we've been doing that, whether it's in the garden or within the broader landscape. And one, one image here that uh, I really love, and it's very evocative, this amazing oak tree. This is called Queen Elizabeth's Oak, and it's in Cowdery Park. And it's the oak tree that Queen Elizabeth um, sheltered from the rain in during her reign in, and, and, and the date she sheltered in it was in 1591. And at that point of time, the tree was already hollow and she ran into it during a rainstorm and she sheltered within this tree. And, um, and it's of great age, it's a Cecil Oak and it's been pollarded and, um, and it's regrown, but apparently you can fit 10 people inside. Now this tree is a very ancient tree and it's in the landscape. When she sheltered in this tree, it was already a tree of very specific interest and had character and it was a landmark in the landscape. And the longevity of this tree is really important. And it's the longevity in our designs that we seek and try to recreate when we're creating new gardens. So for me, an, a tree as ancient as this is an incredibly important ingredient for us as designers to refer to, but it's in a wonderful setting, which was a deer park created um, pre Queen Elizabeth's reign. And here, this is a, a wonderful um, uh, coppice of, of yews um, in, in Scotland, in, in Fortingall. And again, the yew tree is an incredible tree, Taxus baccata. Now, at home in Europe, and especially in England, it's very much symbolizes pagan sites. It was a tree that was used um, for ceremonial sites and religious sites. And a lot of our English churches and our graveyards have really ancient new trees in because they predate Christianity. The churches were built on the ancient sites of the pagan sites. So um, there's something very magical about these incredible groupings of ancient, ancient yew trees. Um, they feel, uh, incredibly rooted into our landscape and very rooted into our culture. Um, this one, this one here, um, they, you know, this, they, the, the, these yew trees symbolized, um, they, they were the spirit, 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 sorry, spirit. <laughs> spirituality and death. Um, and, uh, it, it was all about uh, resurrection and longevity and eternal life. So in a garden, they're very appropriate. When you plant a yew tree or yew hedges in a garden, immediately it does have that sense of permanence. It has that sense of really being rooted and belonging. And it's something that we have built into our DNA. And we know somehow that these trees are very special. They're revered. And so using things like this in our garden, and we use them in so many different ways within a garden design. And here you can see, uh, this is uh, the Druids Grove in Norbury Park. Again, this wonderful ancient, um, this etching of this ancient uh, uh, grove of, of ancient yew trees, um, which again, from these illustrations, you can already get this sense of, 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 of um, I mean, it does feel very pagan and it feels very much part of our historical referencing. And later you can see here in this churchyard, this is a really ancient yew tree, um, which probably predates uh, the, the building of this church. And it would have been on, on, a, on a pagan site that was later taken over by Christianity. And so these trees are really rooted into our heritage. And uh, this next one, just to show another example, is, is Devil's Hump. It's a burial ground in Sussex. And again, these ancient yew trees on, on the burial mound. So these trees, for me, um, 
represent longevity and represent, I guess, a spirituality. It's, it's, it's helping us to understand a very historic landscape and how certain trees were selected because they were very special. There weren't in England many evergreen trees um, before people started bringing plants back from different continents. There was a holly and box and the yew. Um, and so a tree that was evergreen in the winter was a very special thing. And so it's, it's linked with lots of ceremonies and winter solstice. And um, so in a garden setting, this antiquity plays a very important role. And the interesting thing is how man has always used trees within the landscape to create amazing effects. This is Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland. And this tree was planted in, in the Victorian era in the 1800s. It's a sycamore tree. But look how the estate owner planted this tree just perfectly in the gap between these two hills where Hadrian Wall runs over. You can see in the, on the top right hand side, Hadrian's Wall just threading up to the top of the hill. But how perfectly has this been placed in the landscape? Deliberately placed. This tree has been given a real status by the way it's been placed. So not only in gardens are we placing trees and, 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 and using them in a garden scene, but here in this broader, wider landscape, this romantic version of, of creating this amazing, majestic planting with one single tree, just in this perfect gap in the hills between Hadrian's Wall, uh, is very powerful and strong. And so from things like this, we're learning, we're bringing the broader landscape, the wild into a more cultivated aspect. And the cultivated is part of an estate and it's man-made. It's not an accident, this was planted. And equally, um, these wonderful circular coppices of trees um, that, that were planted in almost to create a very natural parkland setting um, within the landscape. Now, it's not a parkland, but it's part of an estate setting. But just the way these trees are creating this, this wonderful break in the landscape within this pastoral environment, these trees here are all planted out of one single species. So here, this is all sycamore tree. And there's something really magical about just selecting one tree and it's one tree for that purpose. And here the sycamore trees create these sort of round rondels of, of planting within the landscape. Um, and they create a, a different habitat within and a different draw of attention within the landscape. And now this is in the broader landscape, it's not in the garden, but these things have been brought into our landscapes that we're also in a way gardening on a much bigger scale. It's about husbandry of the land. And here, the juxtaposition of the walls where they all meet, and there's this coppice of trees just within the landscape at the junction of where all of these fields meet in the corner. Now, that's something that directly, I think, we borrow from this broader landscape. And this is designed, this has been planted by man in the landscape, but we do similar things in gardens. So what I like to do with a garden design is look from the outside and I like to bring my design from the outside in and gain and gather these elements and draw them into the garden. And at Altabella, where I live in Wales, um, our hedge lines are planted up with oak trees and some of these oaks are, are quite ancient. And the reason that the oak trees are growing in these straight rows along the hedge lines is because originally this was a hedge, it was a stop proof hedge to keep um, cattle from stopping the cattle going from one field into the other. And because the cattle graze the fields on both sides of the hedge line, um, where Jays had planted oak, oak uh, acorns, the oaks grew and they were protected in amongst the thorns of, of the hedge line. And so we end up with these wonderful <clears throat> linear lines of oak trees, especially in the landscape around my home in Wales at Altabella. And because they're on this little rise of the soil where the hedge used to be, they, they give it an ancient feel. The hedge has long gone, but we are left with this wonderful line of trees. Now, this line of trees is something that has come from the necessity of, of enclosing fields and therefore you get lines. And then you can start to see how maybe um, 
as part of our broader landscape, we have started to create avenues or lines of trees within approaches to houses or within parklands on large estates. Now, in a garden scale, we're still doing the same thing. We're doing it maybe with pollard trees on a smaller scale. But directly, this interpretation, you can see how it's come from the lines of trees that were in the hedgerow, but now we're in the bigger landscape and we can start to use these as our wonderful avenues. So here at Rousham in Oxfordshire, these wonderful lime trees that focus the view out into the landscape. So you can see how these, these lines of trees, these avenues, how very early on, um, we already had in a very natural way, the lines of the oak trees in the old hedge lines that formed the boundaries to our fields. Um, but here they've been used as a way of creating an axis or rides through the landscape. And at Rousham, equally within this wonderful Arcadian landscape, um, how trees have been used to create tunnels. So this is a man-made plantation within a lovely garden, one of my favourite gardens, Rousham at Oxfordshire, and it focuses the eye on the wonderful statue by Van Nost, the lead statue that sits at the far end of this tunnel. Um, and it, what it does is so perfectly, it creates darkness and then the statue sits in the light beyond. So we're using it as a tool within the garden to go from light to dark and to focus the eye through the planting, through this large scale of planting onto the sculpture at the end of this vista. And of course, another avenue of trees, um, these are sweet chestnut trees. Um, they were planted after the Spanish Armada. Uh, this is a property in Wales and it's an old avenue that now runs through pastures but would have been the carriageway to a wonderful house. And the reason these chestnut trees were planted originally um, after the Spanish Armada when uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth had all of the Spanish ships, the Spanish ate chestnuts. They had chestnuts for cooking and for eating and the ships were full of chestnuts as part of the food supply. And um, what they did, they gave out to all the large estates in England, chestnuts, which were grown so that each large estate could have the chestnuts from the ships that were caught from the Spanish Armada. And it was a status symbol to say to the Spanish, we've even got your chestnut trees, but they were planted in these wonderful avenues. But look at the character of these majestic ancient trees, how beautiful. So, you know, and, and, Again, these wonderful trees in, in wonderful deer parks. This is the medieval deer park at Haddon Hall um, with the trees in and these ancient ant hills that create this tapestry of undulation with, with, with the ant hills in the landscape. Now the ant hills are in England protected. Uh, they take thousands of years to form and it's an indicator of ancient meadowland. Um, and again, you know, a parkland, but a different parkland. This is Chatsworth. And here you can see this wonderful bucolic landscape, uh, which very, very organized planting of trees in rondels, in groups, within this amazing parkland setting that is grazed. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's part of the view out from the garden. Here at Chatsworth, you have the formal gardens that wrap around Chatsworth House. And then you go into this wonderful park with the bridge over, over the river and back into this wonderful pastoral environment, this, this very man-made environment, but taking inspiration from nature as we've always done. And Copper beech trees are part of our landscape and that we use in gardens an awful lot. Um, and uh, the first copper beech was discovered in 1690 in Germany and 99% of all copper beech descend from that one discovery. So you can see how revered the copper beech tree is. It comes from that one chance seedling that was found in 1690 and how we use it within our gardens in so many different ways. And I'll come back to the copper beech tree uh, later, but it's very much part of our design vocabulary for our gardens and landscapes. And here you can see at Montacute House, the wonderful copper beech tree again in the park, very, very much 
selected for its impact within the park, viewed from the garden. And again, with the oak trees and sweet chestnuts in this park, it's creating a very husbanded landscape. Here you can see the ride which comes out from the garden and a newly planted ride with new lime trees for the future. And also at Montacute House, um, we have another, it's a combination of a very formal driveway and a less formal driveway. So the larger trees on the outside are mixed, it's not one single species. So therefore the avenue effect is immediately more casual, um, but it has, two wonderful lime trees right at the end framing the driveway gates. So we're bringing the formality in there at the end with those two wonderful trees. But coming up to the house and going back towards the gate, you have Irish yews, which, so they're, they're similar to our pagan yews, our very early yews that were used in, in, in pagan sites. But this is an Irish yew, so it's Irish, um, um, Buxus fasciata, which was discovered in the 1700s in Ireland. But here it's been used to great effect uh, to create the formality along this driveway, the punctuation and, and the ability to lead the eye on. And it creates these layers of formality within the landscape. But all of these plants have been collected and used and adapted in a garden situation. And again, the yew tree here. So this is ordinary Taxus baccata but it's being clipped in the most fan fanciful way and in a very fantasy-like way. This hedge has an organicness to it, it has scale. Now this hedge is hundreds and hundreds of years old and that's why it's so nice using taxus you within, within a garden because immediately when you plant it, even as a small plant, it just has that sense of longevity. And that's because it's so ingrained in our own own makeup, our DNA makeup of garden design, we've used it and early man has used it so much. It's such a sacred tree that as soon as you put it into a garden, it has a sense of permanence about it. And whether it's that one hedge or whether here also at Montacute, it, it gets clipped into all of these fabulous topra shapes. It's all the same plant. Um, but we have many different adaptations of how we can use it and how we can use it within a garden, sen within a garden setting. But the, the thing is, it is about the love of plants. It's about creating gardens by using these majestic magical plants that we have as there are brush strokes. There are pens that we paint the garden with and they create punctuation, they create enclosures, they create uh, natural woodlands, if you want to create natural woodlands, they create coppices. So there's many different ways that we can use the same plant. And one of my favorite uh, um, plantings is actually at Chatsworth again. The late um, Deborah De Duchess of Devonshire um, created this amazing serpentine hedged walkway uh, that leads through part of the garden. Now you have oak trees in a very natural way to either side of it, but what's really beautiful is this very designed and man-made serpentining hedge and beach. And of course, we all know what a big beech tree looks like in the wider natural landscape, but this is the same plant and we're using it, we're bringing it in from the outside world, we're taming it, we're doing something completely different with it. And at Altabella, I've used beech, but I've used copper beech to create under the tower um, this, this spiral hedge, which for me spirals, and because our house is an Elizabethan house, the spiral is a very symbolic symbol. Again, it's about eternity, eternal life. Um, and I use the spiral motif here, and it's actually a double spiral that's on a mound. And it's the way that leads you into another part of the garden. And I've used it to form a living green sculpture or a living copper beech sculpture. And you can see in the distance behind the green beech topiary, there's a young copper beech tree. It's a, a, a variety of beech called Rosia marginata. So it's Vega sylvatica, purpurea Rosia marginata that has a wonderful pink edge to the leaf that you only notice when you stand under the tree and look back up through its branches. And it's as though 
each leaf has been cut and looks like lace. Again, this is a particular seedling that was selected and now we introduce it into our gardens and we use it to great effect. One of the nicest ones I've ever seen is on the Stourhead Estate in Wiltshire. Um, and if anyone ever gets the chance to stand under it, it's one of the most magical things to look up through the Rosia Marginata to see this lovely lace, lacy effect you get with the sun shining through uh, the copper leaves with the white edges to the leaf. So single species planting is something that we have done for years, centuries and centuries. This is a beech woodland. A lot of our single species woodlands were planted as plantations in the um, Victorian period. Uh, but what I love about it is the tranquility and the, the purity of these single species plantings. And it's something that as garden designers, we use a lot in gardens. We, we decide just to use one particular type of cherry blossom in a garden because it's stronger by just using the one. But it's come from the outside, from our wider landscape. And it's something that I've grown up with and I've seen through my childhood and my adulthood. And it's something that is so familiar to me, this single plant. And there's a purity and, and, and an elegance that is produced by this. So whether it's this beech woodland or whether it's a hazel coppice, and this hazel coppice is, is planted for the production of, of, of either charcoal or for, for other, other uses for young wood. Um, but I particularly love just the purity of the fresh green and then the carpet of bluebells in the spring underneath. And we do it in orchards. So here in Herefordshire, um, it's a very popular area in England for growing damsons, which is a type of plum, a small cooking plum. And the, 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 there's a great deal of, of, of elegance and power with just one variety planted together. And I love that it all flowers at one time, but this is very much an agricultural field. It's grown commercially and they're all planted in straight rows, but there's a wonderful purity about it. But then at Brockhampton in Herefordshire, in the same area, they've used it within this wonderful Elizabethan house, within the grounds, within the moat of this house. And to great effect, uh, it's, it's, it's a very simple planting, but it creates an incredible atmosphere with this wonderful whitewashed Elizabethan house. Um, now, you can imagine that if this was all different mixed fruit varieties, it would still be very nice, but there's something very magical about just using single species. And I quite often use this within my vocabulary of design. So this one property in East Hampton, um, I decided to plant an orchard of crab apple trees. Uh, it's, it's a house and garden where we wanted it to feel like a, a modern interpretation of an old farmstead. Um, and one of the things I did here um, with the crab apples, this one is called Sugar Time, um, we planted them on ridges. Now, at home in England, we have old field systems that are called ridge and furrow, which are these wonderful flowing, gently flowing humps, these hills within the landscape. <clears throat> and it comes from when they used to plow by horse and they would plow in one direction, turn the horse, plow in the other direction, and the soil would be kicked up into the middle. And it created these things called ridge and furrows. And they then found out that the ridge and furrows, the ridge, because it was elevated, it drained quicker and therefore in the spring, it warmed up quicker because the water had drained out. And so you could get slightly earlier crops on the ridges and increase the area um, for, 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 for crops as well. But I like to take these motifs from the landscape and incorporate them into my garden design. So here on these ridge and furrows, we have the crab apples planted. Again, a single species to represent the old dams and orchards that I showed you before. And here you can, again, you can just see it on these slight ridges. The nice thing about these ridge and furrows, they catch the light beautifully. So uh, the meadows or these lawns, when the sun is low, starts getting these incredible shower, sh shadows that get cast over the, the, the very gentle rises. And here's another image of it going towards the house. And 
something I just wanted to show you in this image, how on one side we have the simplicity of the fruit trees, the crab apples, and on the other side, we have three huge sheared beech trees. So these amazing big topiary uh, beech that sit to one side of the house. Again, it's about the simplicity of this design. It's beech, crab apples, and vines, and that's it in this garden. But these trees, the big topiaries on, on the other side, compensate for the weight and the number of trees on the right-hand side, which are the, which are the crab apples. And they give it a sense of permanence again. It's like the old tree within the park. And using beech, but in a different way, and now combining it with fruit trees, this is a project in Devon. Um, and uh, here we have plum trees. So it's all white blossom in spring. It's all plum. So again, single species. But under these trees, we have cubes of beech. I wanted to add a sense of modernity and I wanted to put a little bit more structure into this part of the garden to give it a little bit more weight. So the beech tree that is our beech tree in a plantation or our big beautiful beech trees in parklands can get used for the hedges like the serpentine hedge at um, Chatsworth or indeed they can be like my spiral at home and we can start clipping them into cubes here to have um, another dimension to this plum orchard and also then in the winter we get a different interest by them having these wonderful rusty copper leaves that hang on all winter with the deciduous trees growing out from them. So you can see how something as humble as the beech tree that grows within our landscape gets brought into our parks and, and, our, and, 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 and the wider landscape and, and is a wonderful specimen tree. Those specimen trees also feed back into our gardens as our wonderful specimen trees on lawns and within, within the gardens. And then we can make hedges, we can create topiary from them, we can create these platforms. So that one plant has so many multiple layers within the garden to create our green architecture of the gardens. And equally at, at the same garden at Southwood Farm, um, you know, fruit trees, we had the plum orchard with the beach underneath, but here, you know, from our earliest, earliest um, growing of crops and, and, and fruit and vegetables, we've perfected and we keep perfecting the art of, of growing and production. So here, we discovered early on, um, or you know, early gardeners discovered that the formality of training fruit trees actually produced a lot more fruit because you're you're creating these horizontal branches that get more more hormones for the fruit buds to grow and produce therefore more flower, therefore more fruit, and it takes up a little amount of space and becomes a very decorative device within the garden environment. So here, you know, again, it's a fruit, it's a crab apple, but um, rather than having them low down at Altabella, I have them as pleach trees. This was very much um, early on in the development of my garden at Altabella, and these were still quite young, but you can see here the summer pruning that is happening to the crab apple trees. Um, and it's the order that we're bringing into a tree that would naturally grow into just a very beautiful natural tree, but we want it to do something different. So we're bringing these trees in from, from for the wider landscape. Um, we select certain varieties of apples and we breed them and we bring them on as, as more delicious edible fruit than the wild Malus sylvestris. And then we have ornamental crab apples that come from that. And here we've used the ornamental crab apple Everest to create this enclosure within my garden that encloses the knot garden and creates a very transparent visible screen. And of course, this screen has, uh, has uh, seasonality as well. So in the spring, it's full of crab apple blossom. And, but you can see how by pruning them, keeping them pruned, you have these wonderful bands, these, these wonderful bands of arms that are clothed in, in fruit blossom. But when you're standing on the ground, you just look straight out under the tree. And I use crab apples in, in, in different varieties for different gardens. This one is called Red Sentinel. And you can see in the autumn, just covered in these amazing red crab apples that last until about 
March. And then all of a sudden the birds just eat them all in one go. Within a week, they're gone. But they last all winter long, which is a really another lovely layer to add into the, into the garden design vocabulary. Um, and within this garden, you can see that we've used the yews for the big lumpy hedge at the back. We've got utopri in here as well. And then we use lots of box as our smaller hedges, which form the pattern making that the lavenders and then the oxide daisies are held within. Again, another view of this wonderful crab apple tree. We deliberately let the branches sag so they feel more ancient. We don't allow here, because this is a Norman uh, manor house, we don't allow it to be too perfect because it would just end up not having the right atmosphere. So we actually allow the branches to become weighted down. And some of them we even train in a, in a, in a rather wonky way so that they have the character of feeling ancient. And at my previous house uh, in Lincolnshire, at Gannock House, we had what I called the green garden room. It was a lawn which was surrounded by a double row of pleached lime trees, linden trees, which um, I trained in a very naive way. I didn't want them to be perfect structured horizontal branches. I wanted it to feel naive. Um, when the house was built in the late 1400s, um, it's something that wouldn't have been too perfect. Somebody would have seen it somewhere in, in a smarter garden in a, in, in, a, in a larger town and they would have come back and not quite known how to do it. And so the naivety of training these trees in a different way gives it the right atmosphere. So I wanted it to look like a really scruffy old bird's nest. Um, and so it has that feeling of the branches all being inter intertwined, but they're not all rigidly horizontal. But then a garden like the garden I created for Laura and Perry at the Chelsea Flower Show, um, we used Copper Beach to create our structure, our, our, our elevated structure of enclosure. So you can see here how, how the Copper Beach used as the topiary. It's, I used the copper because it complemented the colours of all the pink roses and things I had in the garden and it gave a very nice rich backdrop to the garden and to the pale stone wall. So when we're choosing plants, there's lots of considerations. There's the hard landscaping, there's the colour of the house, whether it's a brick house, a stucco house, whether it's a stone house, um, and what colours play off better and what the atmosphere. I wanted to use the copper beach because it added a sense of modernity. I didn't want the garden to feel very Although it was traditional, I didn't want the garden to feel too traditional. So these copper beech pleach trees add a real sense of modernity to it. Um, so I just would like now to show you a garden that uh, we built in Somerset um, a few years ago, designed and built. It's now about eight years old. So it's just starting to get a sense of maturity. Uh, in this garden, again, we used the copper beech and box hedging to create uh, divisions within the garden. But we didn't want solid barriers and solid divisions. We wanted the eye to travel through, but to be held back long enough. So I'm just going to run through. Um, we'll come back to this garden in a lot more detail, but I just want to show you our, our um, renderings for this project. I won't talk very much about these now. You will have these up um, this lecture will be available again and so you could study them a little bit more and you can piece together yourselves where everything is in the garden. Uh, but this, this is one of the aerial views of the house. You can see the pleach trees that wrap around um, on the left hand side of the screen. And then we created different garden areas with cloud hedges of box. Um, and there's a wonderful curved orangery within this garden. Um, it's a medieval house that's been reclothed in Georgian clothes. So under all of these facades is a, is a Tudor house. Um, but as so often happened, it became unfashionable and they put a rather smart Georgian in, uh, uh, exterior over the top, a new facade over the top of, of the Tudor. And this is the plan for the garden. And you can see the garden itself, the formal structure of the garden is very tight to the house. And I'll explain why later, but it's, it's, it's very immediately around the house. And some of the drawings that uh, we presented to the client before we built the garden.
this garden sits particularly beautiful, beautifully in the landscape. Um, and although the landscape which used to belong to the house no longer belongs, we still are able to take advantage of what previous generations have planted in the parkland beyond, um, beyond the garden itself. And we are able to borrow that landscape and the planting from the wider landscape and draw it back in into the garden environment. So here's the view back uh, across one of the lawns uh, to the main facade of the house. Um, you can see the garden is very tight up against the house. The reason for this is that the landscape is very powerful and there's something rather magical about these large expanses of grass. And we didn't want to distract from the view that you got from the house looking out into the landscape. So we kept the landscape of the garden or the more intricate part of the garden very close to the house itself. And we demarked the boundaries of the intensely garden, flower garden um, with, you can see on the left-hand side, the cloudy box hedge, again, keeping it low. So when you're in the house and you look from the windows out, because all of these Georgian windows, the sill height is very low. So when you're, it's all about the view out, they were designed to be sitting down in the house and have these great views out into the landscape. So we don't want to block that off. We want to enable people still to celebrate the view as the house was designed. So our cloud hedges of box are kept low. And then we mark the center of the house with four large topiary um, standard uh, beehive topiary domes in Copper Beach. Now, the reason we chose the Copper Beach for this garden is that um, to the right of the house, there's a church and the church has a double row of Copper Beach trees that runs up to the church and they're very dominant seen from the garden and you'll see some images in a minute. But here, so we've borrowed that same language of the copper beech trees that were planted to get to the church and we're bringing it into the garden. So we're uniting the garden with the history of the planting of the beech trees to the church and they create the punctuation and the boundaries to the garden in a very transparent way leading back out into the landscape. And the box hedging that runs on both the right and the left hand side that creates the division from the wider landscape and from the lawns also helps to create our areas of garden that are gardened. And the reason we have all of these structural plants is it is for the love of plants. It's for putting our beautiful jewels within. So now we've created these picture frames and these frames that frame all of the wonderful soft planting that we put in. And it enables us then to be able to add flowers into these areas and create different atmospheres and different color schemes within these different frames. But before we come to those images, just show you one more here. The copper beech trees are above the orangery and they run up to the church. So you can see the referencing back to the topiary trees that demark the edge of the more intensely gardened area and how the lawn just flows through and the lawn flows out and then the lawn goes out into the um, landscape which is a grazed landscape with meadows and grass beyond. What's particularly beautiful about this house is this wonderful curved orangery that sits to the side of the house. And here within these one these 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 cloud hedge enclosures um, you can see that we start coming into the garden and this is where it becomes more flowery. And for this client, we wanted again to create something that was very elegant and very simple. It's all created with white flowers in this part of the garden. It's called the white garden. Um, and it's further highlighted with this lovely sculpture that sits at the end of this border. and behind it, the copper beech again. And then a cross view back towards the copper beech trees above the orangery and the copper beech that demark the edge of the intense garden side into the lawns. And here you can see the view back out over the lawns and back into the landscape beyond. So by creating a garden that is tight to the house, we give much more to the lawn here, which immediately links it to the landscape beyond in a better way. And 
enables the garden to feel part of the landscape in a better way. It, it actually draws the two together much better. If the garden expanded too far out, it would foreshorten our view in, into the distant view. So a very simple planted palette, the old existing chestnut trees, a view through to the church and the Tobe Pre Copper Beach. And one of our, our main constraints that we had was trying to hide cars and trying to hide cars from the upper bedroom windows. So one of the things that we were very keen on is using the copper beech tree so that when you're in the garden, the hedge hides, hides the cars, but when you're in the, up, on the first floor, the copper beech trees hide the car, but it creates an enclosure on the inside as well as screening from the cars on the outside. And as you come up, towards the door of the house, you come up a flight of steps, and then you go along with a reflecting pool on one side, which reflects the lovely columns of the portico um, and takes you to the front door. Now, interestingly, the, 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 the front door is in this rather unique, wonderful, um, covered, covered um, outside portico, which is at an angle to the rest of the garden. And it's in beautiful, the house is built in beautiful hamstone, which is this wonderful golden colored stone. So here you can see our hedges have changed. They're no longer cloudy. We've come into the more formal part of the garden by the main entrance to the house. And here we cut the hedges square and straight. And again, they're in box. And in contrast to the cloudy box under the pleach copper beech trees. So the same material used in a different way to great effect. And here by the reflecting pool, again, just these layers of clipped shapes, creating the sense of some sense of antiquity, but also with this modernity. And then within the main courtyard garden, looking back um, across the reflecting pool, we have what we call the knot garden, which is filled with lavenders in the summer. And we've created this out of, again, the box cut square, but the box are at different heights. So we're, 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 we're reflecting the tradition of knot gardens where sometimes the hedges dip under and over another hedge, but we did it in, in a more contemporary way. So they're not dipping in and out and under, they're abutting up to a taller hedge. Another view from the door of the house out into, into the parking court beyond. And here's the knock garden um, with hedge heights at different heights. And this ends to in this part of the garden is enclosed with this wonderful curved wall with these urns on top. And there's a wonderful archway on the left hand side by the stable that takes you through to the stable courtyard beyond. And um, when you come through that door, um, again, we're framing it with some topiary just to mark the entrance. We're using the same taxis tree uh, that we've seen before, but to great effect with, with it being topiarized to bring more formality into this area of the garden. And as we come through the gate, everything on the, on the internal courtyard is either box or you, um, which has more formality. But as we come through the gate into the stable courtyard, uh, then all of a sudden it starts to change and we start introducing some beach topiary. So we're lessening the impact of formality by adding another layer, which is the beach. And here it's green beach. So we're dressing it down again. The hierarchy is copper beach near the house. And when we come to the outer areas, it goes to the green beach. And it's mainly beach with the odd yew topiary. And it's coming out of just this chipping limestone chipping surface. So again, we're, we're lessening the formality. But then as you leave the property, you go out of the main gates, um, everything here is in Texas, is in you, because it has that feeling of antiquity, of great age, of, of longevity, of tradition. And so it's more appropriate here to have this all in Texas rather than start mixing it with the beach. And coming back into the stable courtyard, looking through the arch, uh, the beach and the self cedars in, in the chippings. 
And then as you come up to the back of the house, this is the day-to-day -day entrance that the family uses. Then we start layering it up again. We create an enclosure by adding the pleach crab apple trees and they sit in front of a copper beech tree hedge. So before they came out of the cloud hedge of ta uh, out of box, now they sit in front of a copper beech hedge. You can see the large copper beech tree on the uh, top left hand side of the screen and this takes you to the back door the everyday door that's used by by everybody and it takes you um neatly into that area which is is a winter knot garden but again here we've enclosed the area where the family park their cars so that when you're in the upper levels of the garden uh, up on the, the higher end of the garden you don't look down onto cars but we've lessened the formality by having them as fruit trees these are the steps that go up to the vegetable and cut flower garden here. And uh, to the right is the copper beech hedge, which takes you through into the winter knot garden. And this is the winter knot garden. So this knot garden is created with, with box hedging on the outside and the crisscrosses in the middle is sarcococca. Uh, which is also known as winter box. So in the winter, it's a very highly perfumed garden. It flowers and it's sweetly scented. We have topiary of osmanthus, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, again, sweetly scented. And it's full of hellebores um, in the winter. And then in the spring, it has crown imperials, Fritillaria imperialis, uh, bright orange ones that grow out of the patterned hedges. So here you get the uh, more of a view going out into the broader garden scene um, at the back of the house. We've got the winter knot garden. We have the copper beech hedges that enclose on one side the winter knot. And then on the next level up enclose the cut flower garden. And on the right hand side, we have a single species grid of flowering cherry trees, ornamental cherry trees. And the, the vegetable garden with its ancient lovely walls flanked at the end by this lovely avenue of copper beech trees that take you to the church. So you can see how we've pulled in the ingredients from the outside as we do when we pull our ingredients out from the broader landscape and from our heritage of, of landscape plants. And looking back to the house across the cut flower garden. And here, looking at the orangery, the back of the orangery with the grid of cherry trees. And this is um, a photo taken from under a really incredible um, sycamore tree, a, a London plain. It's absolutely enormous. It's one of the biggest ones I've seen. Um, it must be about 300 years old. It was specifically planted as a landscape tree within the garden. And from here we have this wonderful um, swing seat that hangs, um, that, that adds again a bit of modernity. And from under this canopy, you look up to the garden with the box hedging that encloses the white garden. So here looking finally out, from, from the more formal part of the garden, back over the lawns to the boundary hedge of the field at the far end. Again, selecting, we edited a lot of trees out of this landscape. So we started to create within the garden the feeling of a parkland, which then links to the parkland beyond. And you can see beyond the trees in the fields. So when we started this project, the, this particular large lawn was covered in trees and it was quite a, a, a hard decision, but we decided to edit quite a number of trees and take a lot of the trees out, which weren't as good, good as specimens. And just to leave the one or two trees, which gave us the impact that we needed to blend it back into the parkland. So here, the shared beech that I planted in East Hampton in that one garden with the crab apple trees. I just wanted to show you this because it's about scale as well. So it's about choosing the right trees for the right scale that we need. And these are enormous great big shared beech. And I particularly wanted to show you this because the next photo shows you the inside of the tree. It's one single amazing great big trunk. And so, you know, when we know how plants grow in their natural environment, and we see big trees, 
uh, in a parkland setting or in a woodland, we know that we can get that scale and size by clipping it as a topiary as well. So it's really great to step into the topiary and see this, this antique trunk um, of, 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 of the tree, um, which you don't see from the outside. So it becomes a magical world within the topiary tree. So at Altabella, um, in the fields above my house, we have wonderful hawthorn trees. Now, uh, this is our native hawthorn, and where we are, we're absolutely blessed that we have mistletoe. Some people um, find it a real pest, but I love this parasitic plant that, that grows and hosts itself on, on fruit trees and, and hawthorns. Um, and again, it's, it's very pagan, and I love that whole pagan imagery within the landscape. Um, but uh, that tree was one of my starting points for my garden because it's like when it's in the winter has no leaves and you just see the green of the mistletree, mistletoe, it almost looks like a topiary tree from the distance. And the next photo shows you uh, my garden looking out to that hill and you can see in the sunshine on the meadow, there's, um, there's that one tree that just sits right in the middle of the framed view. So, that for me was a great inspiration and something that I took as, as one of my design vocabulary images for creating my garden. My garden is surrounding an Elizabethan house and I wanted lots of topiary. So over the years, I've built up these layers using topiary and my topiary create my divisions in the garden. So I don't use hedges as division, I use the topiary. And by placing them close together in some aspects, it's like a wall, it's like a solid hedge, but actually when you approach the topiary, they open up and they allow you to have the views out again. And so that's how I've used topiary trees in my garden. I have copper beech topiary, I have yew topiary, osmanthus topiary, um, and I have box topiary. And then here again, another view of the crab crabapple trees that create the enclosure around my knot garden. But the topiary trees for me form my structure in my garden. And here in the central courtyard, um, which is a j between my studio and the house, I've used the topiary trees as this enclosure. So it's not like a solid hedge um, that's continuous. I've used them and I've placed them. So in the elevation, they all join up. But as you travel through the garden, they are actually very transparent. But when you're in this space, because you view one, one topiary tree behind the other next to another, it actually becomes a solid screen without it being solid. And you can see how they relate back into the landscape. So the trees in the fields, this line of trees is that photo I showed you before, which are the oak trees that traveled up in the ancient hedgerow and the hedgerow since disappeared. Um, but they help with the scale in my garden. So looking out from the garden and into the landscape beyond, the trees are large in the landscape and my topiary is large to match that. So we're drawing the landscape and the garden together by the scale of these trees. And these trees are the trees, the beech trees that we have in the fields around the house, but we have clipped them and we've topiarized them. And that's the art of horticulture that we enjoy. And within the garden, I have a, a very ancient pollarded sycamore tree, um, which I love. And, and, Pollard trees were, uh, in, in the past, they were pollard trees, and it was a way of harvesting timber. So this tree sat in a field near the house that would have been grazed, and they pollarded them at about eight, nine feet high, and that meant that the sheep and the cattle couldn't eat the young shoots that came from after the pollard had been created. And then it would grow new branches, and after 10, 15 years, you would cut the branches, and you could have it for your firewood. Uh, but they create these very interesting shapes that are, are, are created through the husbandry of the land for the production of timber. So here again at home, uh, you can see the topiary and how it creates these divisions and enclosures within the garden and the spiral mound uh, to, the, to the left. One of the things that, again, um, I like to try and experiment with and use, and it certainly isn't unique and it's been done before, um, is using 
hawthorn as hedging. Now I've used them here for my knock garden by the studio and I keep them really th small. It's, it's, it's crotagus. Normally there are field hedges that surround um, all the land and, and the fields around our house. But here I keep them at about 14, 18 inches high. Uh, they need a lot of clipping, but they become really beautiful and wiry and woody in the winter when there's no leaves. But it's the naivety of this plant that I wanted to capture. And it's the naivety and, and the use of the material that links it back to that one tree that had the mistletoe in, in the landscape. And so this is a reflection of, of, of that. And at the back of the house, uh, more topiary roses on the house wall, and again using the box hedging to create pattern making for my flower beds. And the hawthorn again, the same material as a cloud hedge to the boundary to the fields where the cattle graze. So it's using the vernacular traditional hedging plant, but it's been cut in a different way. And in a way it mimics the tree line that is in the landscape beyond my garden. And then just simple things like allowing the grass to grow long and the short grass and the long grass, we're now getting into the softer environment of the garden. And so by having these flower studded meadows, within our framework of the planted architecture um, creates a different softness in the garden. And looking back, these were taken in, in, in late July, August, when all of the Chaster daisies had finished and looking back down to the topiary at the bottom of the garden and just starting to see these layers of plants that have been trained through horticulture. And as you step into the vegetable garden, we then have the color and the softness. Now, this is really the point of the lectures that we create our gardens and it is for the love of plants. You know, there are thousands of plants I want to grow and I can't grow them everywhere in the garden. So I create these areas that I grow my collections within. This is the vegetable garden. It's my potager. It's where I grow my vegetables and it's where I grow lots of flowers for cutting for the house and medicinal plants. So it's, it's purpose is for production of a particular group of plants. And that's the whole purpose of creating these garden rooms, garden enclosures, and creating the design of the garden is that we want to fill them with the softness. So we've talked previously about the elements that create our structure in our garden and the whole purpose of that structure so that we can now really embroider the garden with the pretty flowers. And we can add that luxury of color into the landscape, into our gardens, that very personalized, intimate feeling. And so here I've got roses and calendulas. This is one of my favorite roses. It's a pale peachy colored rose called um, um, Jude the Obscure and then pot marigolds. And then looking the other way into the vegetables and back out into the landscape. Of course, a kitchen garden, vegetable garden is not complete without sweet peas. And then that takes you through to the cottage garden beyond. Again, full of soft planting, phloxes, veronicastrums, althena cannabina, alliums, roses. So it's the softness that is, is, is planted within the structure. And then the plants that I have in the cottage garden, I've started planting in my meadows. So I bring the Verona castrums that are in my cottage garden and in my borders, and I put them into the long grass in the areas where we meet the natural meadowland on the outside of the garden, whether it's roses or Verona castrums, wild scabias. And then finally, as we leave our property, um, Here's a tiny little crooked um, old hawthorn that was just a, a, a raggedy old bush that I clipped into a topiary. Um, and I was really inspired by ladies, the Lady Salisbury's garden um, at Hatfield Palace. And she had, at the old Bishop's Palace there, she had wonderful hawthorn topiary. So as I said before, nothing is original. It's just the way we use it is original. Um, everything is borrowed from a past time, whether it's the trees that sit in the wider landscape that were used in pagan religious sites and we've now used them in our gardens or the hawthorn that sits up at the top of my field and how we interpret it and bring it into the garden. 
So, and again, you know, what we do with the plants here, this is at Iford Manor, and I particularly love this image. It's one of box hedging plants that the lower half is clipped where they can't reach, it's unclipped. But immediately, it's a good photo to show you what it's like when it's loose and wild, and what it's like when it's been tamed. Um, and so you can see how that one plant has a very different feel, clipped or unclipped. And at Haddon Hall, um, this wonderful um, medieval house, Tudor house, um, we again planted topiary trees within a wild flowery mead to create the atmosphere that was needed for this property. And you can see how the topiary trees link in with the deciduous canopy of the deer park beyond. And they come, they all grow from this wonderful wild meadow where we've also introduced martigam lilies and other species, perennials and bulbs. And then coming back across to America, this is a project we're working on in the States, in upstate New York. And this is the view from um, uh, down onto the Hudson. Um, and I really love the uh, Calmias. And this garden was originally planted up by an American designer called um, Ellen, Ellen Biddle um, Shipman. And she used a lot of native plants. She had her, her this garden, she um, used the native plants and they became very much key of the landscape of this new garden that we're doing. But I've included these in here because while we were designing this garden, we were also doing another garden in East Hampton. And when we were doing our research and driving around, um, this imagery became very much the same way I use nature at home in England as my inspiration. Here, it was the Calmias and the dogwood. So here, here's a wonderful picture in the woodland at this one project that we're working on. And this lovely dogwood that just bleeds back into the forest. And then I particularly love, and this was very inspirational, this image of this one single dogwood at the end of a lovely pasture, a wonderful field with the dry stone wall in the distance. And this very much led me into an idea for a garden that we created in, in East Hampton, um, which was to use these dogwoods to create another layer within the garden. And I'm going to show you that garden now. So here um, you can see there were a lot of mature trees at the edge of the garden. We thickened up enormously this boundary so that you couldn't see any houses beyond. Um, so when you're in this garden, you, you have no sense that there's any neighbours. We've really padded out all of the boundary. We created a woodland walk that runs around the entire perimeter of the property. And there were lots of existing dogwoods in the garden that we reused and we moved them to the edge so that it had that effect of that photo I showed you with the woodland and the pasture. And it was the dogwoods just coming out from under the ancient tree canopy. And then in front of that, again, we have our flower gardens that reflect the colours of the dogwoods with the flowers, the roses that are there, and the herbaceous perennials that come out that are set and divided from the woodland walk with a box hedge. And again, I won't talk you too much through this plan. Uh, it's something that maybe if you want to come back online later and have a look at, you can. Um, but basically we have at the front of the house an Edwardian sunken garden and we have um, a small winter knot garden and cut flower garden and then a double border and the pool garden. So again, just picking up on the dogwoods, uh, it adds a really wonderful layer to something that would otherwise be a little bit dark at this time of the year. So the white flowers and the way that they hang out and grow out from underneath the large tree canopy um, creates this really lovely, soft, thick boundary to the neighboring property um, and creates a lovely backdrop to all of the borders with the flowers. So this photo is taken from within the cut flower border with all the cosmos in this section, looking over the hedges and into the double border walk. 
another section of the cut flower garden. E each bed is a different color. You can see the um, the cupcakes, the pink pastel one is is further back, and then we come into this brighter pink one in the foreground, and then the dogwoods with the large trees at the edge of the property. And again, the cut flower garden, we wanted to be very soft. We wanted to feel very meadowy because we have a lot of structure within the garden. So all the planting of the flowers are deliberately designed to feel very soft, very meadow-like, so that they're in contrast to the formality of, of the structure that we've planted and made with using our hedging plants within the garden. The sweet peas that then tie in with the cosmos flowers over the arches and lovely self cedars of poppies, wild carrots, and of course the wonderful sunflowers for cutting. And then the view through the cut flower garden to the bench and more dogwoods behind. And then from the flower garden, the cut flower garden, you can see it in the distance. There's the dogwood in, in the middle of the photograph with the arches made of silver birch for the sweet peas to grow up. And then we have coming from that a double border that comes and travels with a path coming through under the rose arches that circumnavigates parallel to the uh, woodland walk and the Cornice all hang into this border on the right hand side. And the border here is made of very soft colors, creams and whites and peaches, and then the, this wonderful agastache and this wonderful lavender color. And you can see the roses on the arch, uh, not quite in flower here, um, but the roses in, in the borders are, again, just a soft palette of of pale lavendery pink delphiniums and larkspurs and the peters, but all held in with this soft undulating box and dogwoods. And then here looking the other way back towards the house. And then on the other side of the lawn is the pool garden. And again, this pool garden is quite structured, of course, the pool is very formal in its shape. Um, and so on, on the stone terrace of the pool, we have lemon trees in large square copper containers, and these create the formality that link to the pool. And then our bed beyond the lemon trees, again, very meadowy and very soft. So it's about creating these rather veil-like transparent layers within the garden. And they're like horizontal lines. They're like waves that travel through the garden. So you get the first is the water, then the stone, the lemon trees, then you get the, the wonderful soft planting and then the tree canopy uh, with the underplanting of dogwoods. And on the, the railings that surround the pool, the pool code fence, lots of roses and honeysuckles to add another layer but a layer of flowers, not of structure. This is our structure. These are layers of hedges. So this is viewed across the various garden areas. You see these lots, lots of repeating cloud hedges that create this, this tranquility across the garden. And then you get peeps and glimpses into certain areas of the garden. Here, this is the winter knot garden, or the knot garden, not the winter knot garden, but the knot garden, which is full of, uh, it's got wonderful Daphne eternal fragrance and uh, digitalis and all sorts of lovely treasures within here. And this is why we create our structure. It's so that we can put these wonderful plants in the lovely rhododendron viscosum with its amazing scent. Um, and then that's framed by our framing of our hedging. So they're like picture frames around a picture. And the picture is the is, are the flowers and the frames of the hedging. So here you can see using sarcococca here for our little low hedges. So we get the perfume in the winter and paths threaded through leading you to a table and two seats in the corner. Um, planting for the future, another tree. This is a linden tree on the right hand side. 
and keeping the flower palette very simple. And as you travel around the garden, it's a garden that um, leads, one garden room leads to another garden room to another. And as you travel around the house along this brick uh, or this tiled walkway, um, this takes you around the house, but then you can step from here onto the path and you go into the sunken garden. And again, the sunken garden has been designed exclusively to fill with flowers. Again, we were very lucky to have a wonderful copper beech tree here. I particularly like the placement of the bench, the twig seat, the cast iron twig seat in white under the copper beech. It just draws the eye through into that darkness. But then in front of all of that, we've got this sunken garden that is just full of Edwardian style flowers, lots of astilbes, roses, lavenders, um, self-seeded poppies, eupatoriums. Uh, it's an endless list, very cottagey, very informal, meadowy planting. And again, we've used uh, plants to flank the steps. Every entrance into the sunken garden has uh, a pair of standard wisterias. And as you travel around the upper part of the garden, um, the garden changes pace slightly. Uh, going towards the drive, we have a meadow area. In the meadow, we have roses growing wild from the meadow. A new beech tree that we're starting to shear. So we cut the tops off the beech tree and we're now starting to shear it. And it just adds again this other layer, this other um, layer that's gardened through horticulture and through the practice of gardening. And this leads you out to the driveway through this gate or leads you from the driveway into the garden. And again, the drive softening it, built, we built this dry stone wall. We've covered the dry stone wall in roses and in front of the dry stone wall so that we don't have such a vast area of gravel and down the middle track, we've planted creeping thyme, lots of foxgloves growing against the wall, Alcamilla mollis, and eventually this will just do its own thing. It will seed and seed and seed until we just have two narrow tracks. And it's what I call form follows function. So where the cars drive, plants won't grow and everywhere else they will volunteer themselves. And they are the next layer that design the garden for themselves. And the cladding of roses on walls. Coming back into the garden again, the rose growing in long meadow grass. And then this leads you to the sunken garden, which is just full of flower and scent. So we have wonderful philictrums, um, lilium, um, pink perfection here, astilbes. There's a rill that goes around the edges, the um, borders, and at the center, there's a fountain. So you can see here this wonderful old wellhead that we converted into a fountain it enables us to have borders that run all the way around the outside that are then framed by a more formal rill with water iris in. And then we have four beds in the center that surround the old wellhead that spits water. And this is the last image that I've, I have in, in the presentation that I just wanted to, to just really, to me, um, sums up um, the love of plants. Yes, we use plants to create our structure. And the whole reason for the structure is that we then have these wonderful areas within the structural planting that is filled with whatever color, whatever smell, whatever flower we want to place within this garden. And that is the delight of gardening. And, and, and I got into designing gardens because I love gardening and I love plants and I just can't get enough of them. So I hope you've really enjoyed um, the talk. Um, I believe we have um, a, a, an answer and que a questions and answer session now. Um, so I'll, I'll hand that over to Caroline now. Um, someone asked if you would cite again the source of the gardening drawing from the 1500s. Yes, that, that is, um, it's from one of the earliest English garden books and it's called The Gardener's Labyrinth. You can get um, facsimile copies of it and it was written by Thomas Hill in 1526. So it's The Gardener's Labyrinth by Thomas Hill 
and written in 1526. And o Oxford University Press um, has uh, printed it as a, as a facsimile copy. Thank you. What planted structure do you find yourself using the most? Well, that really depends on, on, on the gardens and, and, and where we're gardening and creating gardens. Um, uh, at home, I would say that our planted structure is probably beach box and you are the three main ingredients that we use. And I couldn't say I have a favorite because they all perform differently. I love all of them equally. Um, and, and, you know, each of them has, you know, we can, we can treat them in so many different ways that they have a completely different feel. The same plant can be treated in, in so many ways that they're so different each time you, you garden them in a different way. Another question, do you use hornbeam for hedging in the UK? Yeah, we use lots of hornbeam. We also use hornbeam for topiary and for pleach trees. Um, and it's a particularly good, good plant to use if you've got a wetter site. They take the wet better than beech or taxus. Do you have any suggestions for box alternatives that do not require intensive trimming? Um, well, it depends how you want to use the box. If you want to use the box as formal hedges, then of course you would have to trim them. So if you want something that doesn't require as much trimming, there are varieties of box that don't grow as fast. So um, there's, there's um, I mean, the, 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 the very old fashioned box that people used to use a lot for, for small hedges was um, Buxus fruticosa, but now with box blight, unfortunately that's one of the ones that's really prone to box blight, but there are now new varieties of box. Um, I planted in my garden a variety, now the names just um, just escaped me, um, Rococo, Buxus Rococo. And that has a very natural way of growing. So it naturally grows into these cloud shapes that you don't need to prune it, you just leave it. And it grows quite slowly, That it's sort of, and it's very relaxed. So it actually forms these very natural cloudy shapes. So that would be one if you want the structure and you don't want to be forever pruning it would be a better one and and it is actually very resistant to box blight as well so you've touched on this but one of our audience members wants to know how has the box blight affected your extensive use of box um it's affected us really badly no no and it's affected everybody everywhere badly you know it's such a staple part of our design vocabulary and uh, it's one of my favorite plants i think as you asked the question which was my most you know the one i would use it would be box box would have to be the one i'd like to use the whole time um we have some clients are completely organic and we treat box with an organic um uh, uh, um, um, preventative of uh, box blight um, and that seems to work well but at some point you always get the box blight but I'm still persevering I'm not going to give up on it um, uh, so you know we try as hard as we can it's about creating good ventilation keeping the plants clean I have box I've just had another attack of box blight I then cut all the affected bits out and it regrows and every year I go through the same cycle but um at least by, by May, it's looking good again. And I feed it and feed it and feed it. <laughs> Thank you. A few more questions. Are magnolias planted in the UK? Yes, we plant magnolias. Um, uh, we, we grow a, a lot of different types of magnolias. Um, I use a lot of magnolia salingianas. One of my favorite ones is Elizabeth with that lovely pale yellowy lemon color. Um, there's another one called Heavenly Scent that is a beautifully scented spring flowering Solingiana. But equally, we use Grandifloras um, and uh, we use Stellatas. And yeah, we, we're, we're very lucky because we're actually very mild in England. So we can get, we can, we can grow a lot of um, magnolias that in certain parts of the state on the East Coast, you wouldn't be able to because it's too cold. So with our Gulf Stream, we, can, we, we tend to be able to grow an awful lot of magnolias. And something else you touched on a little bit in your presentation, but what are some ways in addition to using larger plant material to add a sense of age and history to your garden? Um, well, I think 
I mean, one, one thing that we do a lot with, with fruit trees is when we're planting, especially, especially as spalliard fruit, we actually deliberately weigh the branches down and bend them down right at the beginning when they're really young so that after five years, they already feel like old trees that have gnarly branches. So part of our horticultural practice and the way we garden those plants as young plants, we're already designing into them and creating that sort of feeling of sagging branches. Um, the other thing that adds a great sense of, of maturity into a garden is right at the beginning, we do a lot of self-seeding. So if we create a formal border and we have paths that come up to the borders and we can sow into either the joints in the paving, right at the beginning, we'll already, when we plant the garden up, sow those joints full of the same plants that are in, or some of the plants like Alcamilla mollis that are in the borders. So immediately we're softening and we're invading the areas where maybe they shouldn't be and we're bringing them into other parts of the garden and letting them establish so that it looks much older because they've escaped from the borders and they've come into the paths and into the driveways. Similar to the photo I showed you at the end, the driveway of the property in East Hampton, where we've deliberately planted into the drive in a way that would happen if we left it, but it might take 10 years. Fascinating. And I will have one last question regarding larger scale heritage trees. What is your approach to pruning or altering the shape of these trees that are outside of the primary garden area? Um, well, it, it depends completely on the tree. Um, what I really like to do when they're really ancient heritage trees is about the longevity of them and the health of them. So that's my principal driver is um, any work that would be done would be to make sure we keep the tree as long as possible um, and, and uh, take damaged and rotten wood out. Now, the view of that is changing um, now that they believe that actually it's better to leave the old wood in the trees, that it's better for the tree to leave them. So we're sort of on, on, on a cusp of we used to really look after them and cut all the dead wood out. But now the belief is, and I actually, I'm changing and I actually like the trees when they're not these ancient heritage trees, um, leaving leaving the, the dead wood in, in them. Sometimes we slightly reduce the canopy of trees um, so that um, we can stimulate new growth if needed. And um, other times, such as oak trees, um, they naturally sometimes go through different stages of life in their life cycle. So they naturally prune themselves. So with oak trees, you quite often get the upper branches die back, but it's a natural way of regenerating lower down. Um, and that in, in itself is beautiful. So it, it, it's varied, um, but generally we, we, it's about looking after the trees the best possible way. Um, um, so that, uh, uh, we, we have the trees as long as possible and we have them with us for as many years as possible. Thank you so much. And I, I want to thank you for a fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you also to Bunny and thank you to all of our guests who joined us for today's lecture. And I wish everyone a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.